Okay, everybody. This is uh, Part B of Chapter 27, dealing with the uh, reproductive system. And here, primarily, we're going to be talking about the rest of male reproduction, and we're going to start in on the female reproductive system. Now, the male reproductive system has one role, which is to produce and distribute the male gamete, the sperm cell, right? Um, in order to control the rate of sperm production, there is a set of endocrine glands that interact in order to not waste resources and energy producing sperm when it's not necessary. And it consists of the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary and the gonads. And the way this works is that gonadotropin releasing hormone is going to induce the production of follicle stimulating and luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary, that targets the testes. The luteinizing hormone causes the release of androgens, and the follicle stimulating hormone causes the release of androgen binding protein. And in addition to testosterone production, inhibin production will also be generated. When the testosterone levels get to a certain point, right? What will happen is that gonadotropin-releasing hormone um, production will slow down, follicle-stimulating and luteinizing hormone will slow down, and the rate of spermatogenesis will slow as well. Okay, So that's, that's the bottom line. The androgen-binding protein is critical because it concentrates the testosterone near the, um, the spermatogonia and accelerates the rate of mitosis and thus the rate of meiosis and production of the spermatids in the sperm. Okay, So other effects from testosterone you're probably um, somewhat familiar with because it is a, a PED. It's a performance enhancing drug. Athletes take this in order to gain a competitive advantage over um, their, their rivals because it increases muscle mass it increases bone density, it increases hematocrit, okay, um, by inducing um, increased production of protein in the face of um, exercise, right? You can exercise, and if you're taking extra testosterone, your muscles will heal more rapidly after the exercise is over, and you can, you can do more workouts in a smaller amount of time, and thus develop more power. Okay. The problem with this is that um, when you're taking lots of testosterone, you can inhibit the production of gonadotropin releasing hormone, which will inhibit the production of the gonadotropins, LH and FSH, and that will cause the testes over time, if this goes on for quite some time, to atrophy. And then when you go off the artificial testosterone, which you're taking through a needle, um, you won't have a source of normal testosterone other than your adrenal cortex and the result will be that your male secondary sex characteristics will um, not vanish but they'll become less prominent and your female secondary sex characteristics um, will end up uh, becoming more prominent right so you'll lose body hair um, you'll you'll have breast growth you'll have um, a change in fat distribution, you'll lose muscle mass, uh, and so on, okay? So, th it takes time to achieve balance, right? And after that, the testosterone and sperm production remains, let's say, a, a declining state of stable, okay? Because as we age, one of the things that occurs is it GNRH production falls, um, well actually testosterone production falls, GNRH, FSH, and LH production actually go up, and these, the production of sperm goes down, okay? But this is a gradual process that takes place over many decades, and it's the result of something that's called low T, okay? Um, low testosterone levels are typical as men age, often by the time they're in their mid to late fifties, they have um, less, much less than half 
the testosterone they had when they were in their 20s. Okay? So you can see the setup here, right? The androgen binding protein allows the testosterone to concentrate near the spermatogonia that accelerates the rate of mitosis, accelerates the rate of meiosis, and accelerates sperm production. And then once the testosterone and inhibin levels get high enough, we feed back and we suppress anterior pituitary and hypothalamus until the levels fall again. Okay? All right. What does testosterone do? What is it made from? Testosterone is produced from our dietary cholesterol and it gets chemically modified into dihydrotestosterone in the prostate and estradiol in the brain. But the bottom line is that it prompts spermatogenesis and it enhances male secondary sex characteristics. Right, deepening the boy's axial and body hair, increase in bone density and hematocrit and muscle mass, and so on. Right? Deficiency of this leads to atrophy, semen volume declines, erection and ejaculation can be impaired, and we treat that with testosterone replacement. Now that's very different from um, taking testosterone as a PED. Right? Testosterone replacement is just um, giving you back the testosterone that you lost over the preceding decades in order to get the levels back up to what they were um, maybe when you're in your 20s or your 30s. Right? But those are the effects of testosterone. Right? The libido is the result of the testosterone increasing the sex drive and that of course is to promote reproduction right? so that you can maintain the species. And it also jacks up the basal metabolic rate, which is the rate at which you burn body fat when you are at rest. Okay. It also has an effect on the nervous system. Um, it is critical during male development that we have a testosterone burst that exerts its effect on the nervous system. And this extends into adulthood. <clears throat> because the adrenal cortex doesn't produce really enough testosterone to maintain normal testosterone function. Okay, so if you end up having either tissues that don't respond to testosterone, which can happen as a result of a mutation called testicular feminization syndrome, or if you have um, damage to the gonads, then what can happen is that you'll actually develop female secondary sex characteristics and even though you're biologically male you'll present as female okay you'll have a small penis you'll have undescended testes and you'll likely be sterile okay? you can see how the testosterone levels change this is the burst that happens while you are in utero right and that masculinizes the brain and it also um, tilts the development of the genitalia towards the, the male um, pathway. So what happens is that the, the paromesonephric ducts disappear and the mesonephric ducts um, are sustained. Right? And that becomes part of the male duct system, the, the, the uh, seminiferous tubules, the epididymis, the vas deferens, and so on. Okay? And then you can see that we have a small burst during um, childhood, and then we really kick up during puberty, right? And then we say, stay steady, and then look at the decline um, as we get older, right? And this accounts here, this decline, for the reduction in sperm production, right? Which tracks it, and that's not a surprise, okay? Now, the female reproductive system has a very different job. Okay, the female reproductive system not only has to store and distribute eggs, but it has to house the developing um, infant for the nine months from fertilization to birth of the neonate. Okay? The ova are the female sex cells, okay? and the ovaries are the female gonads. The sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone, are the predominant ones that are produced by the ovaries. But again, there is some testosterone production in females. 
The accessory duct system includes the uterine or fallopian tubes, the uterus and the vagina, which is the birth canal. The internal genitalia in the pelvic cavity include the ovaries, the uterine tubes, also known as the fallopian tubes, and the uterus and the vagina. Uh, the uterine tubes can also be called the oviducts. Okay? The external genitalia are the external sex organs. and You can see here in the cutaway of the female reproductive system um, a lot of differences with the male, right? Number one, the urethra, which is here, and the bladder here, are exclusively for the use of urination, right? There is no uh, sexual release through the urethra, okay? The counterpart of the penis in the female is the clitoris, which has a corpus cavernosa, has a rectal tissue, has a prepuce and a glands, just like the penis does, okay? The birth canal right, the vagina leads up to the cervix, all right, which leads into the uterus, which has a fundus and a body and a cervical neck, okay. You can see the fallopian tube here, and that's the ovary, right, and these are the fimbriae. These are the suspensory ligaments. This is the round ligament, the uterosacral ligament, and these stabilize the position of the uterus in the abdominal pelvic cavity um, so that it does not prolapse or twist or buckle. Okay? Um, pubic symphysis is here, right? You can see the greater vestibular gland, which produces lubricant in preparation for intercourse. Okay? The fornix is simply this recessed area, okay, where the cervix enters the vagina, all right? Smooth muscle makes up the myometrium of the uterus. The endometrium is made of two layers. There's a basal and a functional layer. It's the functional layer that's shed with menstruation. The basal layer stays in place, okay? And then um, you can see the labia majora and minora. The labia majora is the female counterpart to the scrotum. The labia minora is the female counterpart to the underside of the penis. The fallopian tubes are the female counterpart to the vas deferens, and the ovaries are the female counterpart to the testes. Okay, so this is an example of what's called sexual dimorphism, in which <coughs> the same structures look different in the male and the female of the species, and that has to do with the influence of a portion of the Y chromosome called the SRY, the sex determining region of the Y chromosome produces a protein that forces the male development when it's present <coughs> and in the absence of the Y chromosome you get the female development which you can see here okay one of the important things to note about the female reproductive system is that it is an open system okay there's an opening that starts at the vagina goes all the way through the uterus through the fallopian tube and because the fallopian tube is not physically sealed to the ovary, <clears throat> material from the outside can enter the abdominal pelvic cavity and cause infection, and that can lead to conditions such as pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. Okay? In addition, <coughs> sometimes the endometrium can escape the confines of the uterus and end up <coughs> in either the rectouterine or vesicouterine pouch, and that produces a condition known as endometriosis. So those are the ovaries. They're held in place by the ovarian ligament. The suspensory ligament is going to anchor the ovary to the lateral pelvic wall, and the mesovarium will suspend the ovary. The suspensory ligament and mesovarium form what we call the broad ligament, which dangles like a cape from the underside of the fallopian tubes and the, the ovary. Okay, And it supports the fallopian tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. Again, made up of connective tissue and secretory epithelial tissue. And you can see here <clears throat> on, on the left side of the figure where these ligaments are located. Right There is the ovarian ligament. There is the suspensory. This is the broad ligament here. All right. Down here is the uterosacral. Okay. And then there is the 
round ligament, okay, which you can see here, right? So this, again, stabilizes the position of the organ inside the abdominal pelvic cavity. You can see the layers of the uterus, right? The endometrium, which engorges with blood and nourishes the baby, the myometrium, which is smooth muscle, and the parametrium, which is basically similar to the peritoneum in its composition, <clears throat> hence it creates a lubricating fluid that lets the organ move without irritation, inflammation, and scarring. Okay. The external os is the opening into the cervical canal, which then opens into the internal os and opens into the body of the uterus. Right? The fundus is the domed upper region. And then you've got the fallopian tubes. Right? You have the isthmus, the narrow portion of the tube, the ampulla, the widened portion, the infundibulum, the area that broadens and ends in the fimbriae, which stroke the outer surface of the ovary and are part of what leads to a process known as ovulation, where we release the egg from its follicle, which is the chamber that it sits in inside the ovarian cortex, which is the outer layer of tissue under this capsule. Okay. All right. The blood supply to the ovaries comes from the ovarian arteries and the ovarian branch of the uterine arteries. There is a tunica albuginea around the ovary, just like there is around the testi, and there is an outer layer of germinal epithelium, and then there is a cortex where the follicles and the gametes are found, and a medulla where blood vessels and nerves are located. In the cortex, you find the follicles that contain the oocytes, and they are surrounded by follicle and granulosa cells, okay? They're called follicle cells if they're one cell layer thick, and they're granulosa cells if they're multiple layers, okay? The follicle progresses from primordial to primary to secondary, and then finally um, vesicular or graphene or sometimes tertiary follicle, all terms for the same thing, okay? The antrum fills with fluid, the follicle bulges from the surface of the ovary, and then at mid-cycle in the female, there is a spike of luteinizing and follicle-stimulating hormone, and that combined with the action of the fimbriae on the surface of the ovary weaken the wall of the follicle enough that the egg pops out, and that is ovulation. And then 99 times out of 100, that egg gets sucked into the fallopian tube and works its way towards the uterus. Okay? The remaining cells in the ovary that don't come with the egg and form part of what's called the corona radiata become the corpus luteum. That means yellow body. And that is a temporary endocrine organ whose job it is to produce large amounts of progesterone in order to continue to prepare the endometrium of the uterus for the arrival of the egg. Okay? so that if the egg has been fertilized, it has something to latch onto and get nutrients from. All right? And what sustains the corpus luteum, um, if there is an implantation, is the development of a structure um, called the chorion. Right? And what happens with the chorion is that it produces human chorionic gonadotropin which causes the corpus luteum to sustain itself for the first trimester while the luteum continues to make progesterone. Okay, so it's a, it's a communication between an embryonic structure and the remaining follicle cells in the ovary. Right? So the primordial follicle, you'll see a single layer of follicle cells and the oocyte. More mature follicles, you'll see the granulosa cells. And you can see here what this looks like, right? This is a cross-section through an actual ovary. You can see the germinal epithelium out here, primordial and primary follicles, right? You can see some primaries here. There's a secondary, you can see more than one layer, right? And there's a vesicular follicle, right? There's a vesicular, there's a vesicular, okay? And these are mature and ready to rupture, right? And you've got the albuginia around the outside, okay? And then in the core, of course, would be the medulla, 
right? Okay. Now, the, the female duct system is different from the male duct system in that it forms an open system. And we discussed the fact that as you move from the vagina through the uterus through the fallopian tube, there is an opening in the abdominal pelvic cavity between the ovaries and the end of the fallopian tube. And that serves as a passageway for pathogens to potentially invade that space. Right? It's different in the male because the pathway from the urethral opening all the way back to the seminiferous tubules is a sealed system. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is also why, since the oviducts are not in physical contact with the ovary, that occasionally when ovulation occurs, when an egg pops out of the ovary, uh, it can be lost in the abdominal pelvic cavity, and if it's fertilized there and in plants, that's what we call an ectopic pregnancy, where um, the embryo begins to develop outside the womb, and generally what we have to do there is uh, remove the implant in order to save the life of the mother. The um, fallopian tubes lead into the uterus, which leads into the vagina, which is the birth canal. The uterine tubes are going to receive the ovulated oocyte, which is usually where fertilization happens if there are sperm in the area. The isthmus is the narrow region where the tube hooks up to the uterus. The ampulla is a distal expansion that contains the infundibulum that is fringed with the fimbriae near the ovary itself. Okay, And the purpose of the fimbriae is to stroke the surface of the ovary in order to aid in ovulation. Okay? The oocyte is carried both by peristalsis and ciliary action towards the uterus after it leaves the ovary, and there are non-ciliated cells that nourish the oocyte as well as the sperm that also line the oviduct. The uterine tubes are covered externally by peritoneum, the mesoalpics being mesentery that supports the uterine tubes. And here we are back at our diagram of the female reproductive system, this being the deep and this being the superficial side. And again, note the location of the ligaments that stabilize the position. Now, don't get the impression from the way that this is drawn that this thing stands straight up like the letter T, okay? It does not the uterus is usually bent forward over the bladder, right? And then the oviducts and the ovaries are going to be along the lateral body wall, okay? So this thing is actually leaning forward, and these project backwards, okay? In an ectopic pregnancy, the oocyte is fertilized in a location other than in the oviduct, okay, and begins developing outside of the uterus. Um, often this will abort naturally with massive bleeding, but we try to avoid that um, by removing the implant before that happens and the mother suffers from internal hemorrhaging. PID is just infection that spreads through the abdominal pelvic region because pathogens have an open pathway from the opening of the birth canal all the way into the abdominal pelvic cavity as they exit um, the region near the infundibulum. Okay? This can cause scar tissue and lead to infertility because it can potentially block the oviducts. The uterus is a thick-walled muscular organ that sits above the bladder and it receives, retains, and nourishes the fertilized egg. Normally it is tilted forward over the bladder. If it is um, inclined backwards or if it's standing up, that's usually uh, a response that you see in intercourse where the, the uterus will actually tent, and that's to aid in the, um, the sperm being able to access the uterus, right? And then from there, hopefully get up into the oviducts and find the egg. The body is the major portion, and the fundus is the domed upper region. The isthmus is the narrow inferior region. The cervix is the neck, and it has both an internal and external os at either end of the cervical canal. The external os projects 
into the birth canal and the internal os is going to project into the uterus. There are cervical glands that make mucus that block sperm entry except during mid-cycle when we want fertilization to happen. Just as in males with testicular cancer and prostate cancer, we worry in females about cervical and ovarian and uterine cancer. And again, this is because of the proximity of lymphatic drainage in this region. About 500,000 women um, annually worldwide are killed by cervical cancer. It's most common between age 30 and 50. The risks are frequent cervical inflammation, STIs and multiple pregnancy. We use a pap smear to detect so that we take a sample of the endometrium around the cervix and then we look for unusual cells. Um, signs of cancer include multinucleate cells and um, cells that form um, piles instead of laying flat. Okay. Every two years this is recommended between ages 21 and 30, every year after 30, and discontinue at 65 if you're negative for a decade. Okay. Pap smear results can be inconclusive, but we have a test for human papillomavirus, which is, a, which is correlated with a lot of cervical cancer. Gardasil is a three-dose vaccine that protects against this, and it's recommended for girls between 11 and 12. Now, you might ask, well, why is um, HPV associated with um, cancer? And the answer is that viruses of this type can integrate their DNA into our own DNA and produce mutations that can convert normal cells into cancer cells. We talked about the fact that the uterus is stabilized by a series of ligaments so that it doesn't twist, buckle, or kink, or evert, which means they literally come out of the body cavity. The mesometrium provides lateral support and is a portion of the broad ligament. The cardinal ligaments run from the cervix to the superior regina and the lateral wall of the pelvis and the uterosacral, as bear their name, run from the uterus to the sacrum. Okay, so those are basically rear stabilizers. The round ligaments bind the anterior wall. So you can see, again, all the supports, right? There's the, the broad ligament, the suspensory, the ovarian, the round, okay, and the uterosacral. Sacs of peritoneum around the uterus include the vesico and rectouterine pouch. And the reason that we're interested in those is that they're often places where pelvic inflammatory disease and endometriosis can first set up. Okay, The rectouterine pouch, as the name implies, is between the rectum and uterus, and vesicouterine is going to be between the, um, the uterus and the bladder. Okay? The uterine wall, of course, has three layers. Okay? The parametrium is a serous membrane that secretes a lubricating fluid that lets the organ move without irritation, inflammation, and scarring. The myometrium is smooth muscle, and the endometrium is secretory glandular epithelial tissue that contains um, glands that produce um, a nourishing secretion for the blastocyst when it first arrives in the uterus from the fallopian tube and also engorges with blood in order to support the growing embryo um, under the influence of first um, estrogen and progesterone and then later on progesterone alone. And it's the endometrium that has both the functional and the basal layer. The functional layer is what is periodically shed during menses, and the basal layer is the remaining stem cell layer that generates a new functional layer, layer after it's been shed. The reason the functionalis is shed is because the spiral arteries that supply it with blood are responsive to the drop in progesterone that takes place during the cycle that causes those arteries to constrict the flow of blood to be shut off and for that layer of the endometrium to literally necrose and 
and come out with the menstrual flow, while the basal layer is supplied by straight arteries, which are not hormone responsive. The uterine arteries come from the internal iliacs and they branch into the arcuate arteries in the myometrium, which become the radial arteries in the endometrium and branch into the straight arteries in the stratum basalis and the spirals, which are responsive to hormones in the functional layer. Okay? So what happens with these spiral arteries is that they actually induce necrosis, which causes the death of the endometrium and leads to it being shed. And so this is unusual because usually um, in the normal course of human development, cells don't die as a result of necrosis. They die as a result of apoptosis, which is a more organized programmed cell death that is usually triggered by events within the cell that have to do with um, the loss of information that can sustain the cell. Okay, and it's an orderly digestion of the genetic material, the organelles, and the cell basically shrivels away. Whereas in necrosis, the cell um, is, is going to rupture and die generally as a result of trauma or, in this case, lack of blood flow. You can see the different layers here, right? Myometrium down here, stratum basale, and then stratum functionalis. It's this upper layer that's periodically shed. This is the stem cell layer, and of course down here you've got smooth muscle. Notice the uterine glands, which secrete the uterine milk that is going to um, nourish the blastocyst for about three days before it implants once it arrives in the uterus. And notice that there is lamina propria beneath the glandular epithelium, just as in all epithelial cell layers. Okay? But it's the basalis that will be retained and the functional layer that will be shed. And you can see the blood supply here. Note the spiral arteries that supply the functional layer and the straight arteries, the radial arteries, that are going to supply the basal layer. Okay, And so this is why the basal layer is retained Okay, and the functional layer is shed because those spiral arteries respond to shifts in hormone levels. They constrict when the progesterone levels fall. The vagina is the birth canal and um, it's approximately four inches long, four to five inches long. It is also the organ of copulation in the female as it receives the penis and it, it runs um, from the bladder and the between the bladder and the rectum from the cervix to the exterior. So essentially what you have in in the female, your genital region is three openings, right? The, the most anterior opening is the urethra. That's followed by the vagina. And then, of course, in the back end is the, um, the anus. Okay? The urethra parallels the course of the vagina in the front and is embedded in the anterior wall. Layers include a adventitia on the superficial aspect, a smooth muscle muscularis in the middle layer, and stratified squamous mucosa with rugae that lines the lumen. Okay, and so again here we see stratified squamous epithelial tissue used in an area of the body that undergoes considerable mechanical trauma. Right, and the the choice of this tissue is so that it will not tear. Okay. There are dendritic cells in the mucosa that, um, again, are designed to assist the immune system by displaying antigen. Um, these may contribute to HIV transmission in some cases. The mucosa near the vaginal orifice is going to form an incomplete partition called the hymen that can rupture either with intercourse or with certain forms of physical activity. The fornix is the upper end of the vagina that surrounds the cervix. It's the recessed region around the, the, the portion of the cervix that protrudes into the birth canal and has in the middle of it the external os. Okay. So you can see the female perineum here, right? The anus, the perineal rafe. There's the vaginal opening, the urethra. This is the clitoris and the hood, right? And then you can see the... Um, anogenital and urogenital triangle, okay?
forming the perineum. And of course the mons pubis is just the fat mound that lies over the pubic symphysis and is covered with pubic hair. The mons pubis we've just described. The labia majora is the female counterpart of the scrotum and it usually is a hair covered fatty skin fold while the menorah are the hairless inner folds and they correspond to the underside of the penis. They joined at the posterior vestibule forming something known as the fourchette. The vestibule is a recess within the labia menorah. The greater vestibular glands are, are on either side of the vaginal opening and they are the female counterpart to the bulbo urethrals and release mucus into the vestibule for lubrication. Well, the clitoris is the counterpart to the penis in the male and contains a glands and a prepuce and erectile tissue. The perineum is simply the diamond-shaped region between the pubic arch and coccyx and is bordered by the ischial tuberosities on the lateral side. So you can see here um, the greater and lesser vestibular glands. There's the clitoris, okay, there's the bulb of the vestibule and you can see the pruse of the clitoris, there's the glands, okay, and that of course is the pubic symphysis. So again, um, you can see sexual dimorphism here. You can see that this would be the presumptive penis. Uh, in the male, the urethral opening would run, uh, the, and the urethral would run through this, okay, um, and then in the, um, in the male, it would be the mesonephrics as opposed to the paramesonephric ducts that are retained. The paramesonephric ducts become the oviducts in the female and the mesonephric ducts become the seminiferous tubules, epididymis, and vas deferens. Okay. The mammary glands are modified sweat glands that contain approximately 20 lobes and function in milk production as nourishment for the newborn. The areola is the pigmented skin that surrounds the nipple while the suspensory ligaments attach the breast to the underlying muscle and lobules here have glandular alveoli that generate the milk. The milk runs from the lactiferous ducts to the sinuses and opens outside to the nipple and the size of the breast is due to the amount of milk it contains and the amount of fat deposits that are contained in the breast. Now an important point with the milk produced by the mother is that it contains antibody and lysozyme which are excellent at knocking back pathogens. The lysozyme weakens the bacterial cell wall so that the bacteria are more likely to rupture under an osmotic shock while the um, IgA in the colostrum first and then the milk that follows that is going to defend against all manner of pathogen. And this is why children that are breastfed tend to have fewer infections and illnesses than children that are utilizing formula. You can see here in the cutaway of the breast the underlying fat and of course the lobules, uh, the lactiferous ducts and sinus and the, um, the, the, the lactiferous glands, the avioli back here that actually form the milk. Okay? And this is why we're called mammals because we have mammary glands that supply milk for the newborn. Okay? Breast cancer is uh, a, a metastatic um, change in breast cells that can metastasize using the, um, the axillary lymphatic drainage and the blood supply to any location in the body. Invasive breast cancer is one of the most common malignancies and it's the second most common cause of cancer death in U.S. women with 13 percent developing the condition. Um, usually epithelial cells metastasize. Risk factors are early onset menstruation or late menopause, no pregnancies or pregnancies late in life, short periods of breastfeeding, and a family history of breast cancer. Seventy percent of women with breast cancer have no risk factors, but there is a known mutation in BRCA1 and 2 that increases the likelihood of breast cancer um, between 50 and 80 percent and also increases the risk of ovarian cancer. So a lot of women that screen positive for those particular variants 
in BRCA1 and 2 will have preemptive mastectomy or preemptive and or preemptive hysterectomy in order to avoid the risk. Okay? Early detection is the key to any cancer treatment. Mammography is uh, the method of choice. It's an x-ray exam that looks for masses in the breast. The American Cancer Society recommends screening every year for women 40 and over and the Prevention Services Task Force on Breast Cancer Screening recommends it for 50 and over. The treatment includes lumpectomy, mastectomy, radiation, and chemo. Okay? A lumpectomy simply removes the tumor mass. A mastectomy removes all the breast tissue. Radical mastectomy, the breast tissue, the underlying musculature, and the axillary lymph nodes. Okay? And the radiation and chemo, of course, are designed to destroy the tumor as it grows by interfering with the ability to successfully make DNA. And the result of that is that the shattered DNA is insufficient to support the tumor cells and they die. Okay? Um, there are drugs available for estrogen responsive cancers. Um, uh, trastuzumab for aggressive cancer cells and tamoxifen which improves outcome for premenopausal women that are early or late stage. Letrozole for reducing the recurrence of breast cancer. Uh, basically what happens here is that the estrogen binds receptor and the receptor binds uh, an area of the DNA that promotes overgrowth of, of cells and that leads to the cancer, right? And so these drugs avoid um, that happening either by interfering with the binding of the estrogen to the receptor or by interfering with the production of the receptor, okay, or by um, interfering, um, acting as a, a substitute for the estrogen that doesn't activate the mutated gene, okay. Radical mastectomy, we've discussed, we remove the breast, the underlying musculature, the fascia, and the lymph nodes. Lumpectomy, only the cancer in the breast, and a simple mastectomy the breast tissue and some axillary lymph nodes and then you can have a breast reconstruction um, if you choose. So you can see here in a couple of mammograms what a normal breast and a breast with a tumor looks like. Often you can feel these malignancies with a breast self-exam which is recommended for women as part of their daily routine. Um, the bottom line of course is that the earlier the detection the more likelihood that the treatment is going to be effective because it will have taken place before the cancer cells get a chance to multiply and move out in the lymphatic and circulatory system and set up secondary tumors throughout the body. The female reproductive system is um, designed to, to generate and distribute eggs and to support the developing embryo fetus and neonate for the nine months it takes to go from fertilization to birth. Okay? Um, generally people have assumed that women are born with all the eggs they're ever going to have but there may be some evidence that new eggs are produced during the woman's lifetime but there does come a point at which the eggs run out. Okay? And when the last egg leaves the last ovary that is defined as menopause, right? And that's the end of the woman's active reproductive life. Oogenesis is the production of the female gamete. It takes years to complete. It begins during the woman's fetal period where oogonia multiply by mitosis. Primary oocytes then develop into primordial follicles and they stall in prophase one having already exchanged genetic material and they wait for two events, okay? They wait for ovulation and fertilization in order to complete meiosis, okay? And up until that point, they sit in this process frozen in what we call dictyotine, okay? And the idea there in dictyotine is that the exchange of genetic material has already, already taken place and we're awaiting the next two events in order to complete the process. Now, this has a consequence, which is that the longer the, the eggs sit in dictyotine, the less likely they are going to complete meiosis properly 
and you could generate what we call an aneuploid gamete, which has an improper chromosome number, and if that gamete's fertilized, it'll more likely lead to birth defects or spontaneous abortion. So that's why uh, in women over the age of 35, the likelihood of things like Down syndrome, Kleinfelter's, um, Turner's goes way up, okay? Uh, there are probably aneuploidies of the other chromosomes as well, but very few of those end up as live births. They primarily become spontaneous abortion, and they don't end up being tallied in the final statistics. So this is one of the reasons we encourage women, if they want to have children, to do it before the age of 35. At birth, a female is presumed to have her lifetime supply of oocytes, and then once puberty is reached, each month, about two dozen oocytes will be activated with one normally um, going to maturity and ovulating. The result is two haploid cells, a secondary oocyte, and a first polar body. Okay, and This is in the activated follicle with the activated egg. Okay, And then we wait for fertilization. Right, The secondary oocyte arrests in metaphase 2. Um, the ovulated ovum, if it's not penetrated by a sperm, will deteriorate, but if it's penetrated by a sperm, it'll rapidly complete meiosis II, forming the ovum and the second polar body, which will also degenerate. So the result of a single oogonium entering meiosis is to generate a single active, useful egg. Okay, So this is different from in the male, where you generate four gametes for every spermatogonia that enters meiosis. Okay, So let's take a closer look at oogenesis. In human females, oogenesis, or egg formation, takes place within the ovaries. Each ovary contains diploid cells called oogonia, derived from embryonic germ cells. Before a woman's birth, the oogonia divide by mitosis. The result is more oogonia, some of which develop into primary oocytes. Primary oocytes are immature egg cells contained within masses of cells called follicles. The primary oocytes then enter meiosis I. This process stops uncompleted until puberty. No primary oocytes are formed after this point. At birth, each female has a finite number of primary oocytes available for reproduction. At puberty, a complex series of hormonal events stimulates changes in the surrounding follicle and induces some primary oocytes to complete their first meiotic division. The division of cytoplasm and cell organelles is unequal, however. As a result, one large secondary oocyte and one small polar body form per primary oocyte. The polar body often degenerates. The follicle containing the secondary oocyte continues to mature until a surge of the hormone LH initiates ovulation. The mature follicle ruptures, releasing the secondary oocyte. At this point, the secondary oocyte has entered meiosis II. This second meiotic division will not be completed, however, unless fertilization occurs. The secondary oocyte enters the oviduct, where fertilization of the oocyte with a sperm cell can occur. The entry of a sperm cell into the cytoplasm of the secondary oocyte triggers the completion of meiosis II. The cytoplasm divides unequally, generating a mature ovum and a second polar body. The fusion of the haploid sperm cell and the haploid egg cell has produced a diploid zygote. Let's compare spermatogenesis with oogenesis. Both processes start before birth, when embryonic germ cells differentiate into spermatogonia in the testis of a male, or oogonia in the ovary of a female. Both types of cells are diploid. However, whereas mitotic divisions continue to generate new spermatogonia in the male until death, in the female, the generation of more oogonia by mitosis halts well before birth. Although spermatogonia develop into primary spermatocytes throughout life in the male,
In the female, some oogonia develop into primary oocytes, but only before birth. Males can continue to produce viable sperm from puberty until death, but females can produce viable eggs only from puberty until the supply of primary oocytes is depleted. Meiosis I does not begin until puberty in the testis of the male. Meiosis I begins before birth and ends at puberty in the ovary of the female. Meiosis II occurs within the testis at any time from puberty until death in the male. Meiosis II begins within the ovary only at ovulation in the female and ends within the oviduct upon fertilization by a sperm cell. The final result of spermatogenesis is four haploid sperm cells for each spermatogonium. In contrast, oogenesis can result in one egg cell and two polar bodies for each oogonium but only if fertilization has occurred. So as we pointed out, right, in spermatogenesis you get four viable sperm with an error rate of about 4% um, in the male from puberty until death, and while oogenesis goes from menarche to menopause and generates one viable gamete and three polar bodies and an error rate of 20%. Now, what happens to those gametes that are made improperly? They generally don't participate in fertilization, or if they do, uh, it results in a spontaneous abortion. So this is another form of natural selection. Unequal divisions ensure that the oocyte has enough nutrients for its one-week journey to the uterus. The polar bodies, of course, are going to degenerate. The ovarian cycle is a series of events that are associated with the maturation of the egg. We have the follicular phase that goes the first two weeks, ovulation at mid-cycle, and the luteal phase that follows during the next two weeks, which is marked by the formation of the corpus luteum and an increase in the project production of progesterone. Only about 15% of women have a perfect 28-day cycle because the follicular phase will vary while the luteal phase remains relatively constant. In the follicular phase, the primordial follicle becomes the primary follicle and the squamous cells become cuboidal and the oocyte gets bigger. The primary follicle then becomes a secondary follicle as granulosa cells form, so you get multiple layers of cells surrounding the ovum. The granulosa cells and the oocyte guide each other's development because they communicate through gap junctions, okay? And you can see here the progression, right? primordial follicle with squamous, right? primary follicle with cuboidal, secondary follicle with multiple cuboidal, late secondary, right? and you can see the antrum here beginning to form, and then tertiary or vesicular follicle, the antrum is complete, the egg is surrounded by granulosa cells and held by a stalk to one end of the chamber, okay? and then in ovulation we of course release, and that is facilitated by a luteinizing and follicle stimulating hormone burst that then uh, is aided by the mechanical um, action of the fimbriae over the surface of the ovary and that ruptures the bulging follicle and then the corpus luteum will form. Okay. Now in, in normal cycle you get one of these follicles per cycle Okay, but some women will pop more than one follicle, and that's how we get fraternal twins, which are as genetically similar as any brother or sister. Okay, um, Some women use fertility drugs, which are super ovulators, and that can result in multiple births. And that's how we got Octomom. The identical twins are different. Identical twins form after fertilization and the formation of the blastocyst and prior to the formation of the embryo. And so for, for reasons we don't understand, um, after implantation, you'll grow a chorion, a stalk, right, that grows roots into the endometrium. And at some point between the implantation of the blastocyst and the formation of the chorion and the formation of the embryo, that cell mass will split. And you'll end up with two genetically identical embryos sharing um, one placenta and a bifurcated umbilical cord, okay? 
and they'll always be the same sex, and any differences in identical twins that you see um, after birth are the result of environmental influences on development as opposed to genetic ones. Okay? And this is one of the reasons why geneticists like to study identical twins in order to tease out how much of a trait is genetic versus how much of a trait is environmental. The secondary follicle then becomes the late secondary follicle. Connective tissue and granulosa cells generate estrogens. Interthecal cells produce androgens in response to luteinizing hormone. And the zona pellucida forms around the oocyte. This is one of the protective layers along with the corona radiata that's going to mask the egg after ovulation from the woman's own immune system because the oocyte, again, is going to be unique in genetic composition compared to the cells in the woman's body. Okay? The fluid accumulates between the granulosa cells. Then we form the vesicular follicle. The antrum forms. It expands to isolate the oocyte with the corona radiata on the stalk. That's basically a cloak of granulosa cells that, again, disguises the egg from the woman's immune system. The vesicular follicle bulges from the surface of the ovary. The primary oocyte completes meiosis I, becoming a secondary oocyte and a first polar body. And then in ovulation, the ovary wall ruptures. We kick out the egg into the fallopian tube. Often there's a twinge of pain known as Mittelschmerz, which is German for pain in the middle, okay? Um, and um, about 2% of these release more than one secondary oocyte, which will form fraternal twins if both are fertilized. And in a normal ejaculate, um, that's, that's generally the case. There's more than enough sperm to get the job done. Identical twins, as we've discussed, um, result from the fertilization of a single oocyte and then at some point the separation of the cell mass to form two identical um, blastocysts that will eventually develop into two identical embryos that share a placenta and have a bifurcated umbilical cord. Okay? What happens in the luteal phase is that the ruptured follicle collapses, the antrum fills with blood, and then the granulosa cells and internal fecal cells form the yellow body, which we call the corpus luteum, which generates large amounts of progesterone and some estrogen. The purpose of the progesterone is to continue to thicken the, the uterine lining so it follows up on the effect of the follicular production of the estrogen and progesterone, right? And that prepares the endometrium for the arrival of the fertilized egg. If there is no pregnancy, the corpus luteum degenerates into the corpus albicans, or white body, which is a uterine scar, in about 10 days. The progesterone levels drop, and then we trigger menstruation. Okay? But if the pregnancy occurs, the luteum will produce hormones that sustain the pregnancy um, for the first trimester because it will be maintained by the production of human chorionic gonadotrophin, which is the pregnancy hormone. That's what you pick up in the pregnancy test. So the HCG sustains the luteum, the luteum sustains the endometrium, and that gets us for, through the first trimester. And then at that point, the, um, the placenta will take over the job. So what follows is sort of a summary of these events, and then I will join everybody in part C of this podcast. The major structures of the female reproductive system are the two ovaries, two fallopian tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. A normal female is capable of reproducing from the onset of menstruation during puberty until the end of menopause. The female is fertile and able to become pregnant approximately during the 13th and 14th days of each menstrual cycle. The total number of eggs a woman will produce in her lifetime are present in her ovaries when she is born. Each month at the beginning of a menstrual cycle, the pituitary gland secretes the follicle-stimulating hormone, which is commonly known as FSH. This hormone stimulates one egg to mature with an ovary. The maturing egg is surrounded by a graphene follicle. 
On the 13th or 14th day of the menstrual cycle, the graphene follicle ruptures and releases the mature egg from the ovary. Because the fallopian tube is not attached to the ovary, the finger-like fimbriae must catch the egg and guide it into the fallopian tube. After the release of the egg, the graphene follicle changes and becomes the corpus luteum, which secretes the hormone progesterone in preparation of the lining of the uterus to support a pregnancy. If the egg is not fertilized, the corpus luteum dies and the progesterone secretion ceases. The menstrual cycle is then completed with a menstrual period. If the egg is fertilized as it travels down the fallopian tube, the corpus luteum continues to produce progesterone. The fertilized egg moves into the uterus where it is implanted. The placenta forms and, for the duration of the pregnancy, it secretes the progesterone required to maintain the pregnancy. Throughout the 40 weeks of the pregnancy, necessary nutrients are supplied and waste products are removed by the placenta and the umbilical cord. When it is time for the baby to be born, the pituitary gland secretes the hormone oxytocin. This hormone stimulates the labor contractions that result in the birth of the child. After the infant has been delivered, the final stage is the delivery of the placenta as the afterbirth. To understand the various ways that medical science can assist reproduction, it is important to understand how the reproductive system functions in both sexes because the cause of infertility often lies equally with both men and women. The main players in the female reproductive cycle are the pituitary gland, the ovaries and the uterus. Their activities are closely coordinated. Each month, one or other ovary releases a single egg, an event known as ovulation. It is brought about by a series of complex interactions between the pituitary gland, the ovaries, and the uterus. The pituitary gland is itself under the control of this small area of the brain known as the hypothalamus. A new menstrual cycle begins when the nerve cells of this center secrete a hormone called gonadotrophin releasing hormone, GNRH, into the network of blood vessels which surrounds the pituitary gland. Stimulated by pulses of gonadotrophin releasing hormone, Cells in the pituitary gland secrete another hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH. FSH travels in the bloodstream, reaching the ovaries. There it stimulates the formation and growth of an ovarian follicle in one or other ovary. The follicle consists of an egg, a number of surrounding cells which secrete estrogen hormones, and fluid. FSH helps the egg to mature and prepares it for release. As the follicle matures, the hypothalamus increases secretion of GnRH. This in turn stimulates the pituitary to secrete a second hormone which acts on the ovary. This is luteinizing hormone, or LH. Toward the middle of the cycle, there is a sudden peak in the blood level of LH. This acts as the trigger for ovulation. Within minutes of its release, the egg is guided by suction through the fringed opening of the outer end of the fallopian tube, starting it on a journey which will take five or six days as it passes down the tube and finally reaches the cavity of the uterus. Meanwhile, after the follicle ruptures, it is converted into this yellowish body known as the corpus luteum. Cells of the corpus luteum secrete the hormone progesterone, which brings about important changes in the lining of the uterus, preparing it for possible pregnancy. In fact, the lining of the uterus, known as the endometrium, undergoes changes in response to hormone levels during the cycle. In the first half of the cycle, known as the follicular phase, the developing follicle secretes increasing amounts of estrogen hormone which encourages regeneration of the endometrium. After ovulation, there are important changes in the endometrium aimed at making it suitable to receive a fertilized egg. These changes are brought about by a secretion of progesterone from the corpus luteum. The secretion of progesterone is maintained for several days, but if the egg is not fertilized in that time, the corpus luteum withers 
and falling levels of progesterone and estrogen trigger the shedding of the uterine lining as the menstrual flow. The cycle then starts again. But if the egg is fertilized, no menstruation occurs as the corpus luteum continues to function, secreting progesterone during the first three months of the pregnancy. Thereafter, numerous changes occur to support the developing embryo.